Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. So let's go back to the first of those because that seems to have been the first big break you got at NCI after Gallo's discovery was interleukin-2. So now you had both uh, a, a cytokine that could allow you to grow lymphocytes in vitro, but also something that could be given to patients in vivo to stimulate the immune system. So how, how did that sort of propel your work? Well, with the advent of interleukin-2, what had been shown was that there were some bone marrow cells could make a substance which would keep lymphocytes alive outside the body. But the minute I heard about that, there were a series of questions that arose. Well, if it kept lymphocytes alive, could it, would it keep lymphocytes alive and dividing in a format that enabled them to have all of their immune recognition? Uh, that is, as they grew, would they just lose that property? And so we try to demonstrate that uh, by developing cells that could recognize what we call alloantigens, that is very strong antigens that are present in one person that uh, inhibit the ability to transplant organs, uh, for example. And so our initial studies were to see whether or not we could develop lymphocytes, grow them in culture, and cause experimental skin grafts in mice to disappear faster. We're not talking about tumor, that's normal tissue. And we showed that in fact we could grow lymphocytes that retain their function in the laboratory and then retain their function in vivo. Well, with that knowledge, we didn't want to cause skin grafts to disappear more quickly. With that knowledge, we had to try to develop cells that could react against the cancer. And very early on, when we grew cells in interleukin-2, we found that in fact they could destroy tissue-cultured cancer cells, have some impact on normal cultured cells as well, just by virtue of exposure to interleukin-2. And we call them LAC cells, lymphokine-activated killer cells. And we studied them for three or four years. Turned out to be a false alarm because they could impact on tiny little tumors in mice before they became vascularized, but by the time they were vascularized, they would not work in mice uh, at all. But interleukin-2 seemed like a molecule that might be able to stimulate those rare cells in the body that could recognize the cancer as foreign or develop cells in the laboratory that could do that recognition. And that then led us to many years and uh, of experiments in the laboratory, but also clinical trials trying to see whether or not either interleukin-2 administration alone or cells that you could devise in vitro that could recognize a tumor and administer those. Uh, and that was a very frustrating time. It wasn't until 1984 that uh, we finally uh, figured out a way to use interleukin-2 to mediate regression. We treated over 70 patients with either interleukin-2 or cells that we grew in interleukin-2 and administered to patients uh, without seeing a response until we modified the schedule of interleukin-2 administration, knowing its pharmacokinetics that is only after half-life inside the body of about seven minutes. Uh, and so we had to alter the schedule. We had to give higher and higher doses, which mediated toxicity until finally a patient that we treated in 1984 who had widespread melanoma uh, was administered interleukin-2 and was the first patient, finally, after over 70 other patients, to show us a tumor regression. Uh, the first time that a deliberate immunologic maneuver could reproducibly cause cancer regression. It was, a, uh, it was one of the few eureka moments that I've had in doing research, but the realization, finally, that after all of those patient deaths, uh, due to everybody had advanced cancer, all would go on to die of their cancer, uh, survived, and that uh, patient now alive over 35 years later. <laughs>